with the scent of potpourri. Films would commit to memory. Crossing the felt ropes, watching from home on my TV, looking at all my eyes can see. They tell me I view obsessively. Hello and welcome to The Obsessive Viewer, we're a movie and TV podcast that covers a specific topic, be it genre, trope, movie, or show each episode. You can find more of our work at ObsessiveViewer.com, and while every episode will always be free, if if you'd like to support what we do here, you can become a patron at Patreon.com slash ObsessiveViewer, uh, (laughs) slash ObsessiveViewer, uh, for (laughs) tons of bonus audio content, including TV and book reviews, immediate reaction movie reviews, Patreon potpourri episodes, movie commentary tracks, and uh, much more. I am currently doing a review series on Stephen King's short fiction, so I have about, I don't know at this point, like 12 hours worth of content at the $2 level for Stephen King's short fiction stuff. So, uh, And that is just the tip of the iceberg. So again, that's at patreon.com slash obsessiveviewer. I'm your host, Matt Hurt, and you can find me on social media and on Letterboxd at Obsessive Viewer. And joining me today are two of my friends and colleagues from the Indiana Film Journalist Association and returning guests to the show. First, we have host of the Odd Trilogies podcast and writer for filmyap.substack.com, uh, Andy Carr. And we also have writer and creator and podcaster at awakenthedark.com, Brent Luthold. Welcome to the show, gentlemen. How are you doing this evening? Doing great. Thank you for having us again. Yeah, it's great to be back. Yeah, of course. So, um, all right. Well, today on the podcast, we're going to be reviewing uh, The Black Phone and Cha-Cha Roll Smooth. The Black Phone being uh, the new Scott Derrickson film uh, uh, based on the short story by Joe Hill that is currently in theaters, and Cha-Cha Roll Smooth is the latest film from writer-director ooh, uh, Cooper Rafe. Is that, is mm-hmm. that right? Yes. Um, and uh, it's currently streaming on Apple TV+. Plus. But first, I just want to um, uh, ask you guys what you guys have done, um, individually, um, on the internet recently, like where, like what, uh, where can we find you online and what, uh, reviews have you posted and content you've done or tweets you've, you've tweeted? I don't know. (laughs) Um, sure. Uh, I'll go, go ahead. Um, I'm, Andy Carr, like you said, um, odd trilogies, our latest, our most recent episode, um, was about the Jurassic Park trilogy, and we've got a new episode coming out about the Jurassic World trilogy. Uh, we're calling it kind of a, a, a two-parter, making up Jurassic June. Um, so covering the the legacy as it exists of the Jurassic Park franchise. Um, and yeah, I'm, I'm regularly writing things on the, the film Yap, as you mentioned. And, uh, you know, I take a lot of BuzzFeed quizzes, too. So that's something else I do on the Internet. <laughs> nice. nice. I don't actually, but, you know, it's something to say. Nice. Well, I like it. <laughs> uh, Brent, what have you been up to recently? Uh, we recently did uh, a podcast episode about Lightyear that mm-hmm. I recorded with my in-laws. They were uh, very gracious to uh, do it twice, actually, because the first <laughs> time we had some microphone malfunctions, but uh, that was a lot of fun. They're super fun to talk to, and uh, Lightyear was it, it, it's a good it's a good movie to kind of it's a good kind of family movie and stuff. Yeah. Uh, did written reviews for uh, Lightyear, Cha Cha Real Smooth, Watcher. Um, was on the was on this podcast uh, earlier this month as well uh, talking about Top Gun and Cha Cha real smooth uh those are kind of the the main things kind of on a uh slight break with uh columns for Midwest Film Journal mm-hmm. I'd done about f- I think five earlier this year something like four or five and going to be writing about uh well, I don't know if I'm supposed to say yeah. Yeah. something else in September. <laughs> yeah, I don't want, don't want to get in trouble. <laughs> so, so that's uh, so that's always fun. Nice, yeah. I, uh, I, I have, I, I haven't written for Midwest Film Journal since the it's going to be Bay. Um, I think yeah. when I did um, the Island, but I think I can probably say it here um and for their no sleep october i'm going to be uh and i'm sure like i know that one of one of my listeners is gonna 
be very excited about this, but um, I'm going to be uh, writing an essay about uh, The Devil's Backbone, which I'm very excited to finally see and, and write an essay about. So looking forward to that in October. Um, yeah. And also, I just want to say that on uh, Patreon, um, I've, re- cha- I've changed around the... Um, the tiers a little bit so now everyone gets early access to content so if you pledge at any level you get early access to podcast episodes including um anthology which is my solo podcast that i just relaunched after a long hiatus i'm very much uh enjoying getting back into the groove of it so check that out anthologypod.com and uh okay do we have enough shameless plugs and and uh uh information out here and would you guys want to jump into the main event episode here well you can find you can find brent and i both on letterboxd as well yes it'll be my last bit of sluttery before we get into the meat of things nice and what would those usernames be uh mine is uh dandable like Mm -hmm. like a like mandible but with a d instead of an m nice (laughs) nice i was able to dab awake in the dark for letterboxd all my other social media is weird but (laughs) yeah one i would tell one worked Nice. Nice. And I'm, of course, at Obsessive Viewer on Letterboxd. And we love Letterboxd. And um, mm-hmm. yeah, so it's it's great. Also, it, I haven't done this in a while, but um, if you're listening and you want to be considered for a free year of pro membership on Letterboxd, uh, the first one to um, share this episode on social media and tagging me at Obsessive Viewer um, or the page... Um, will get a free year subscription to uh, Letterboxd Pro, which gives you stats and everything. So a little incentive to spread the spread the word. So uh, that's just, awesome. Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's a really great deal. Yeah. Okay. So we have two reviews tonight uh, for two new release movies, and I'm very excited to talk about both of these movies. They they could not be more different than each other, but mm-hmm. such yeah. is the case with, with what I do here on Obsessive Viewer. <laughs> Um, but first up, we're going to talk about the black phone and as is customary, we're going to do a non-spoiler and then spoiler review. When we transition to spoilers, I'm going to play a clip from the trailer so that you guys can have a buffer, but also as always check the show notes for timestamps to navigate the, um, spoiler and non-spoiler sections. So the first review of the night, the black phone, um, as I said previously, it is directed by Scott Derrickson, written by him and C. Robert Cargill. Um, adapted from Joe Hill's short story from his excellent short story collection, 20th Century Ghosts. And uh, and it is um, a, a humdinger. Um, <laughs> the <laughs> plot summary. Oh, that's what I was going to say. It's currently in theaters. That's <laughs> that's what escaped <laughs> me. Um, and the plot summary, courtesy of IMDb, is... After being abducted by a child killer and locked in a soundproof basement, a 13-year-old boy starts receiving calls on a disconnected phone from the killer's previous victims. So, first of all, I want to ask you guys um, if you guys have any um, history with the short story that this is based on or Joe Hill. And if so, what did you think of it? If not, what were your expectations for the movie uh, going into it? And Andy, do you want to get us kicked off? Um, sure. Yeah. Uh, I have uh, virtually no history with, uh, the story or Joe Hill. Mm-hmm. Um, I have kind of only peripheral, uh, uh, uh familiarity with Stephen King, his mm-hmm. father. Correct. Yes. Um, uh, so this was to me just kind of, it was, you know, just another, uh, another horror movie to watch. I knew it was based on something, so it had reputation, but, um, for me, it was mo- mostly the thing I was coming to it with was like Scott Derrickson. I've yeah. seen Scott Derrickson movies, you know, um, sinister and that sort of thing. So I was kind of just interested to see what he's doing in his, uh, post Marvel life. Nice. Nice. Uh, I highly recommend Stephen King. Uh, just mm-hmm. shameless plug, Tower Junkies. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, Brent, how about you? Have you had any, um, have you read any of Joe Hill's work or, and, or what were your expectations going into the black phone? Uh, yeah, not familiar with Joe Hill. Didn't realize till after this movie that he was related to Stephen King. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so I, I didn't, didn't know that at all. Um, this, yeah, for me was more, um, 
I, I, I love Sinister. We'll talk about Sinister. I, I love Sinister. Mm. I think that's like a really, for the kind of movie that it's trying to be, which I think is like pretty kind of popcorn horror with like some kind of, I don't know about a headier stuff, but certain mm. kind of artistic ambitions behind it. I think it's kind of a really strong confluence of that. So Aubrey and I, it's kind of one of our favorites. So that came out nice. about 10 years ago, I think. Um, the Black Phone is the same uh, writer, basically director, writers, and star uh, mm-hmm. as Sinister. So, like, kind of this movie for me was I was excited, really, kind of for those reasons. Like, it's kind of uncommon to have all those people sort of come back together. Yeah. Also, this is you know whatever. I'm sure Scott Derrickson had other issues, but this is mm-hmm. kind of the the one that's uh, that uh, Scott Derrickson left. Uh, Doctor Strange 2 for. Right. Uh, so it's it, it kind of, you know, you kind of put that up in your head. That's probably not really <laughs> the way he thinks of it anyway, but uh, you're like, well, it's probably got to be pretty good, you know, if he's turning out more <laughs> right. money. So uh, those are kind of my expectations going in. Nice. And yeah, I uh, had, I've read the story a couple of times. It's, I mean, like I said, that whole short story collection of Joe Hills is phenomenal. Uh, there's a just wide range of cool stuff in it. Um, and so I was excited about it. I, I shamefully have never seen Sinister. Um, and I, I really need to, cause I've heard really good things about it, but I was excited for it just because of the, the kind of concept, the, you know, ghost children calling, of calling, a, a kidnapped kid so that, um, they can help them kind of escape is really, really, uh, when reading it in the story, it's very effective, but also it lends itself so well to the like visual medium of film. So mm. I was looking forward to it. And right. Yeah. So. um, So, yeah. So what did you guys think about uh, the black phone? Like, how did you in non spoilers? Uh, did it deliver on its promise of, you know, abducted kids and uh, creepy Ethan Hawke? Go for it, Andy. Drop the bomb. <laughs> um, yeah, I guess I felt like this movie was fine. Mm-hmm. Um, it, it didn't... Uh, I, I was kind of excited for this movie because it, it like first started getting reviews at some point last year, I yeah. think, and just kind of kept getting its theatrical or its wide release delayed. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I'd kind of, you know, uh, built it up a little bit through through reading those. Um, so I'm, I don't know if I expected a little bit more or something, but, um, yeah, I don't know. It, it felt, it fell a little flat for me. And I think a lot of that came from, um, there's kind of two dynamics going on in the movie, right? There's the horror element of, oh, this kid's been kidnapped and he's trying not to get killed by this weirdo in a mask. Who's gotten it, got him in his basement. The other element is of it is kind of the, uh, I don't necessarily want to say coming of age, but like child drama. He's got uh, the main character has got a sister mm-hmm. and she's got some kind of nebulous uh, uh, dream abilities um, yeah. and they have a relationship and they're very supportive and protective of one another. And so when he gets kidnapped, she's looking for him. Um, and they of course have kind of a, dramatic and traumatic home life uh due to their their father but um neither of those elements really grabbed me in the way i wanted them to i I felt like the the drama felt flat because it wasn't really given enough time and the horror fell flat because it only tried to be scary like at least to me like three different times and they felt like very cheap just kind of sound aided jump scares Mm -hmm. so i was kind of left in this weird middle area where I've, I, the entire movie, I was just anticipating it to turn into something that it wasn't. And it, and it never went there. It was just, Oh, okay. It's, it's over now. And that was, that was the movie and it was okay. <laughs> <laughs> Interesting. Okay. I, I probably won't fight back with you too much on that, but uh, Brent, what did you think? <laughs> yeah, I, I, I liked it more than that. Um, so the, yeah, this played at fantastic fest in September. And I know what you're talking about, Andy, because like, I feel like, I feel like about once a month, I don't know, someone at Universal, who's probably an intern, I <laughs> saw a post on Reddit that was like, the black phone is 100% with six reviews on Rotten Tomatoes and whatever <laughs> on Metacritic. And it's like, 
Okay. Like, yeah. have more than like six people reviewed it? You know? <laughs> so, Fantastic Fest is, Fest is not, it, it, it was in September. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, this movie was supposed to come out originally in January, which is like usually a dumping ground. And then it got yeah. pushed like February or March. And then it got pushed to June. I didn't think that had to do really with the quality of the movie necessarily. Mm-hmm. I think that was probably just more timing and, you know, so yeah. probably looking at their slate. Um, but yeah, so kind of just release wise is, is, is sort of strange. Fantastic Fest is weird like that because it's mm-hmm. it's around the same time as like Telluride and like other like other, you know, uh, TIFF, I think, is around the same time, too. Mm-hmm. But yet they're usually smaller movies that aren't really prestige pictures. So it's mm-hmm. sort of like they're not going to get a release that's going to be like in October or November. Like it's going to be super quick. Yeah. So it's kind of always awkward to shuffle around. But anyway, all that, putting all that aside. Um, yeah, I liked it a lot. I I don't like it as much as, as Sinister. I, 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 you know, it wasn't up to that level for me just in terms of just like being, you know, the whole package. But I, I think it, I think there's a lot that, that it did that I was really happy with. Um, I thought just the the atmosphere of everything that takes place in 1978. I think they they really get the the sort of kind of grungy, sort of like dirty look to this. Not just that this movie, a lot of it takes place in a basement where you know kid is being kept, but they, even like outside too. It's just sort of like that gross part of fall where it's like the the leaves haven't quite fallen yet. It's just sort of like overcast and sort of mm-hmm. sort of icky. Um, everyone wants to fight everybody. Yeah. yeah um like everyone is super aggro like at, the, at this certain point of like where these teenagers are like we'll, we'll talk specifically the context but like there's a part where basically a, a, a kid bumps into a pinball machine mm-hmm. and the other kid's like you screwed up my game and then he just starts wailing yeah <laughs> but, like, but but it's not i mean but it's just like eh, it was a little more maybe rough and tumble back then and uh that to me is kind of a good setting for what this movie ultimately ends up being, which is kind of a, almost a sort of, uh, uh, if I could make like the bar mitzvah analogy between uh, Cha Cha real smooth, that is kind of like a coming into, you know, yeah. you know, adulthood <laughs> thing, but it's kind of like a trial by fire. Um, so, so anyway, I liked all this, that, that stuff. Ethan Hawke is very creepy. All the, mm-hmm. all the stuff that you, that you want there, his mask is like the mask work for him. The two part mask thing we'll talk about was yeah. so well done. And I just, I love that design. And uh, yeah, I, I, I like the conceit of this, that it's, and it's a really dark premise. It's a really dark premise yeah. that, I mean, this guy has, you know, he's a serial killer. He's, you know, abducted these kids, you know, tortured them psychologically physically they're dead and it's like this is his next victim but he's going to get help from the other victims i mean i mean kudos to derrickson for even taking on this story and saying like let's they don't make it lighter it's not it's a dark movie but it's about like kind of doing the, the work to a certain extent like like let's focus on like this task and the way they kind of regiment that um I, I really like so yeah I, I, I did. yeah I really like the kind of structural thing to it as well like kind of piece by piece finding different things for him to do which we'll talk more about in spoilers and everything but overall I I really enjoyed it mainly just for what it is which is a pretty pretty cool like you said dark and uh kind of grisly it's it's pretty bloody um movie and and with its violence is is really good the aesthetic of the 70s is really shines through um in it but there are some things here and there that i just didn't didn't really like all that much um i'll I'll say what i liked first what i liked first was the way that the movie uses uh the space of the basement in particular when finney is answering the phone and when he's talking to the other kids the way that we see like the the dead like the reanimated corpses basically of the of the dead kids behind him and the way that it was always out of his eye line or his eye yeah his eye line uh throughout the movie right like that that was really cool that was really cool inventive and inventive and just a really cool technique um and i liked that in terms of originality but i like and i don't want to seem like a like oh i read the story snob but the entire subplot with the sister and her her kind of like like premonition dreams or whatever 
just felt like it felt like it was shoehorned in to pad the story and i think that that's what it was because i do not think that that's in the story at all like and it just felt like that wasn't that was very underdeveloped for me um and then i also mentioned on my letterbox review that it's it, it like ethan hawk's performance is amazing it's the standout performance for me um and he's super creepy very very cool um but the movie like that that elevates the movie past being a what what I think I put in my uh in my review was um uh it cosplay um because yeah. it really feels like a lot of it is just kind of riding the coattails and tone and style of of Andy Muschietti's it movies um which I get, but like, there's one instance of it where it's like, okay, this is one, one, one casting choice where I'm like, okay, that just have him do something else, anything else except for that. But we'll talk about that in spoilers. But anyway, that's my word vomit of, uh, of my kind of conflicting thoughts on it. Overall, I liked it though. I, I enjoyed it. Um, any thoughts on that word vomit? <laughs> Um, I don't know specifically which moment you're talking about, but there oh. were there were two scenes in particular where I thought visually it was lifting. I don't know about the casting necessarily, but visually it was really riffing a lot on specifically it chapter one. So mm. so yeah, I, I can I can definitely see that. Okay, yeah, Andy, did you uh, see any kind of it connections in it? Um, I definitely got the vibe. I think that it was more just kind of a general thing for me that the look of the film and obviously with it being set in uh, sort of a a retro era that has a lot of kind of modern nostalgia tied to it. um, It's in that uh, it's darker like it, but it's also got some of that stranger things energy. Mm -hmm. um, And yeah, but I, I did kind of appreciate you guys touched on it. Um, how, I mean, it was a little bit cartoony at times, but I appreciated the brutality of the child interactions, like the kids interacting with each other. There's a, yeah. there's a bully fight at one point and the get the kid who's getting bullied gets the upper hand over his, his oppressor and just absolutely beats the shit out of him. Like yes. blood everywhere, blood right. on his hands, blood mm-hmm. all over his face. The kid is screaming. It, it's mm-hmm. a little bit horrifying. Yeah. And then he keeps going and it's like, <laughs> okay, this is a little absurd. Yeah. Um, but I did kind <laughs> of appreciate that. I think I like when, when movies dealing with kids and kid issues, don't pull their punches because kids yeah. don't always pull their punches. No. You know, we, uh, as adults, we like to think of children as like the kind of softer and easier humans, but they're, they're brutal to each other verbally and physically. Oh yeah. Um, and so I kind of liked that element of it. Um, and even to adults, yeah. not speaking from experience. <laughs> right. Yeah. <laughs> kids can be mean. <laughs> Yeah. It's like that scene at Step Brothers. Yeah, we're gonna we're gonna go on the other we're gonna go yes. the other way home. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yep. Uh yeah, that the the kind of the violence of that scene in particular with the bully is it's really it's it's really interesting because I I kind of went into that scene thinking like, oh yeah, okay, this is this is kind of satisfying. Like, this dude is just gonna kick his ass and like he deserves it because he's a bully and everything. Mm-hmm. And then it goes like it goes way too far. <laughs> like it, it's like <laughs> intentionally so. I think it's just like it's he, he keeps pummeling him, and I'm just like, dude, dude, stop, stop, stop. He's already dead. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Not that well, he died. And the other thing. Yeah. When they when they do that that early in the movie, because mm-hmm. um, that's really early on, um, I kind of thought that th- that was going to, I don't know, some somehow inform the rest of the film or mm-hmm. somehow kind of begin this theme of I, I don't know what it would be, but something about you know I don't know times were harder then or kids were yeah. rougher then or something or childhood trauma and that sort of thing, um, but it never really felt like that kind of excessive child on child violence lent itself to anything other than kind of shock value. I mean, I think later in the film, the creepiness of Ethan Hawke's character, you know, he doesn't 
Derrickson doesn't shy away from that. And I appreciate that, but that doesn't feel connected at all to me, Mm -hmm. to the, to the, the scenes of interaction between the children earlier in the film. Um, but yeah, I, I kind of thought we were getting some sort of commentary or something, but then that it just ended up being kind of there to be there. Yeah, it kind of seemed built around the the main character, Finney, his reluctance to fight back or his reluctance to yeah. you know rise up or, or whatever. And I'm like, yeah, I mean, it, that is a part where it kind of didn't really connect that well for me in the end, um, which we'll talk about in spoilers. But at the end, like I was still satisfied with it, but I did mm-hmm. feel like it wasn't quite as clear a narrative through line throughout the throughout the movie. So so I, I get that disconnect. I do. Yeah. I think most of the this stuff that can kind of be taken maybe from from that scene where, where Robin is uh, you know beating on Moose, I think was the name of the the bully is kind of in that scene afterwards where Robin and Finney are talking in the bathroom and you know he's basically saying some of the stuff that you guys were saying. You know, you have to learn how to stand up for yourself. Mm-hmm. Sometimes you he said he was like I, I like um, I think Finney asked him that he's like why didn't you just like stop he was clear that i'm not going to mess with you anymore and he said i was like making a statement or whatever um right. which you know anyway we're not in spoilers so i, I can't say right. whether or not that there is symmetry there but mm-hmm. all that to say that yeah i, I agree I, but i i see what you're saying like thematically yeah it's not necessarily because at a certain point a lot of it we're, we're with finney you know in the basement and then gwen having her dreams those are kind of like the main two things so we don't yeah. like the other kids in terms of the school violence don't necessarily uh f- just factor in it much as much it kind of it kind of falls by the wayside there's yeah. a scene i thought that was even more brutal with the like the bullying stuff specifically basically um i don't have to tiptoe around this basically when finney's like bodyguard quote unquote is like no longer around mm-hmm. it's like open season oh, and these yeah. three bullies oh. like all gang up on him and that was like brutal and then gwen uh mm-hmm. finney's sister um comes to help and like she gets kicked in the face and it's like oh my gosh like these yeah. kids are just wiling out so oh yeah um so yeah I, I can see where thematically yeah it might not connect fully I, I i get that but uh yeah it does set up a just a different time or you know i don't know maybe they do things different in denver I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> maybe uh so 78 they had said they, they, um they were talking about uh, Texas Chainsaw Massacre. Robin mentions yeah. that, mm-hmm. which I believe came out in '74. I that haven't looked it up, so right. I don't know. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So they were they were talking about that, and I was like, I was thinking, like, I think Halloween came out in '78. So I don't, know, I don't know why these kids are so violent. <laughs> I guess I was trying to, <laughs> I was trying to figure out, but uh, I guess you got to blame the movies. I don't know, but yeah. uh, <laughs> but regardless, I think it. I think all it does is just set up that, like, yeah, it's kind of a scary time and place to to be that age and have to be in that fight or flight mode and, and sort of decide. And, and basically what Finney, you know, of course in the movie, um, he's kind of for, forced on that decision more in a life, life or death, you know, kind of, kind of grander yeah. scale, not just like, how do I get home from school? Like how am I yeah. going to uh, survive? So. Yeah. And I think that that's kind of part of, part of why it didn't really connect fully with me like there are other parts of the movie that just didn't didn't really connect with me which we'll talk about but um the kind of through line of him standing up to bullies or him being bullied and then and then being in this you know um abductors lair serial killers lair and everything um i think the i think specifically the brutality of that scene where you know he and gwen get just like kicked the like the crack the crap kicked out of them um the brutality of that like kind of like it it is very like there's blood it's very violent they don't shy away from it and i i don't know i kind of feel like that uh i don't know i might be walking myself into a corner but it kind of feels like when he gets to like ethan hawk and everything it's obviously obviously it's a completely different scenario and everything but i mean we just saw like this very you know uh aggressive violence and everything so they have to kind of really up the ante relatively speaking for the violence of that and i don't i don't know if it just really landed as uh, as strongly as it could have i guess not to say that yeah. they should have tem- tempered it down or, but yeah sure yeah i kind of felt that way that the the brutality of the early parts of the movie almost kind of outshined where it goes in the end which sort yeah. of I don't know, pulls the rug out from under your 
monster or your villain, um, mm-hmm. which is, I don't know. Yeah. I kind of like that though, personally, because it sort of, it sort of foreshadows violence. that doesn't come a lot of the stuff with the grabber that, you know, Ethan Hawke mm-hmm. is a much more like psychological torment. Like I don't want to get mm-hmm. too much into it, but ba- uh, basically he mm, kind of almost gives him ways to escape mm-hmm. sort yeah. of, or think that he's escaped. Yeah. You know, it's things like that, that are, I don't want to say too many other things, but like, where a lot of what they're doing is just talking, but there's that realization between them that like it could get very violent very quickly. Um, So I don't know. I think actually that stuff earlier on with the bullies, it kind of primed me for that sort of violence where that, you know, whatever it, it, for a lot of, a lot of the movie, it doesn't really happen. So I don't, it actually kind of worked for me in a, in a, in a weird sort of, uh, um, Reverse psychology sort of thing, I guess. Yeah, yeah. Okay, sure. Um, what did you guys think of the different? And again, non spoiler. But what did you guys think of the different? Um, the different things that Finney tries when he's trying to like get you know escape, get escaped from it to to escape his his captor. What did you think of the variety of those? Because there's a there's a bunch of different things that almost feels like a little bit not video gamey but it just feels kind of like a like okay well now this didn't work so let's let's do this let's or let's do this now mm-hmm. and yeah how did you feel about the kind of progression of those different uh those different suspenseful moments um with with finney um i think when the movie kind of gets into that and the the cycles start turning of uh, Finny trying different things. I think that for me is really where it started to feel, um, I don't know, a little bit repetitive. Okay. Um, cause it, it, once the phone starts ringing and Finney starts mm-hmm. answering and he starts figuring out what's going on, that these previous victims are reaching out to help him. It started to feel like Finney wasn't really, doing or figuring out anything on his own and he was just kind of constantly being told okay do this all right well that that didn't work okay somebody else is going to call all right do this and he's like okay i'll do it um and then that doesn't work out um and i almost wish maybe the movie the our, our perspective as an audience was less omniscient like maybe instead of being able to see Ethan Hawke sitting upstairs in his chair waiting for Finney to come upstairs and try and escape we're with Finney the whole time and he thinks he can escape and then he goes and tries it and sure enough the dude's there waiting for him I think there was just a lot of from from the script having the the previous victims do a lot of the explaining uh to the um visual choices of, of showing Ethan Hawke's character, the grabber, sorry, Mm -hmm. uh, showing the grabber doing things upstairs apart from Finney. I think that took a lot of the agency away from our main character, which Mm -hmm. then made me feel like less compelled to root for him. It was more just like, well, who's going to explain to him the right answer, you know, and, and then we'll be, then we'll be ready to be done. You know, that was a little bit frustrating for me, but, um, I'm also being the the negative broken record over here, so I'm sure Brent can lift us up a little sure. bit. Sure. Uh, I just had to I had to be gross for a second. Mm-hmm. So there's this is an early early thing that he's told to do by one of the past victims on the phone. Um, there's basically uh, soil uh, you know, towards the foundation that's under a rug or something like that, mm-hmm. and basically he kind of starts digging that up, basically digging a hole, and then. Uh, flushing this kind of soil down the toilet just to you know get rid of it or whatever. Mm-hmm. I'm like, that is such a grody image. Like I look, I understand <laughs> it's soil in the toilet, but like, look, it looks like someone flushing down a huge dump multiple times. And it, again, like, but there is something to that in this movie where it's like, there's just something kind of gross about like that era in the 70s. I don't know what it is. It's like everything is just like that. That sort of like beige and light beige and dark beige and brown and light brown dark. it's like all those kind of sort of sepia tones so anyway i know that's sort of gross but all that to say um i liked it and i i liked what 
I basically like the payoff, I'll say. I mean, without getting into spoilers, I like the payoff in terms of what those things are. I thought during it, it was a little silly, like, what? Each of these kids only get one call. It reminded me of the Family Guy Spider-Man thing. Everybody gets one. It's like, (laughs) well, why? Like, because, like, we don't know the rules, and that's okay. Like, I I didn't really care about, like, there's certain things like where are they and like mm-hmm. whatever uh, like what is, is it the in between you know is it like insidious mm-hmm. or whatever it's like it doesn't really matter that's not yeah. what it's about it doesn't really care about that um mm-hmm. there's one supernatural thing that i think is set up that does not pay off if it did i totally missed it mm-hmm. but the first kid that he's on with says the grabber can hear the phone but he doesn't know it or something like that mm-hmm. and if that is paid off i do not remember it because at no point does the grabber interact with the phone besides saying, mm-hmm. put that down. Like, it's not like, yeah. who were you talking to? What is yeah. the, like, so that whole thing, supernaturally, whatever is happening at that element, um, yeah, I, I, think, I the thing did not pay off. So I, I don't think know. the line is something along the lines of like, he can hear it, but he like, doesn't believe doesn't it or be- something. Yeah. He, yeah. I, I, think, I kind of yeah. expected that to end up, I'm with you. I thought it was setting up like right. some sort of reveal about the grabber's history. Like mm, maybe yeah. he is a, you know, the victim mm. of trauma and it became this cyclical thing, okay. but <laughs> that I, I never saw that paid off either. So the one thing I'd say, I think it's an interesting point, Andy, that would be a diff- certainly a different movie if we had had a very limited scope in terms of we were always in the basement. We didn't even get to maybe see, necessarily see Gwen or we only saw like those shots basically where it's like, yeah, the omniscient, camera or whatever it's just can see uh the grabber just sort of sitting there um but i think it makes certain choices with what we like we really know very very little about the grabber oh yeah like if even by the end of this movie we really don't know so that that to me would almost be like i need a little more about him and plus i kind of just want to see ethan hawk because i think he's yeah. really good even when he's sitting there like you know snoring or whatever or not opening <laughs> his eyes or maybe opening his eyes when you don't want him to yeah. like i i kind of want to see that but i you're right it would be a different movie and uh uh if they had done that but i think because i think because they don't you're right there's exposition in terms of um we literally learn about each of the kids uh through these uh, dream sequences that are kind of yeah. like prologues for every every one of them. So yeah, there is quite a bit of exposition and all that stuff. But I think the uh, the um, um, the limited amount we learn about the grabber, I think, is good. But I'm glad that we saw him the amount we did too. Yeah, yeah, I can no, understand I, that. I, I, oh, oh, sorry, I was just gonna say I think that I I can maybe clear up the um, believing the phone thing, but I'll wait for spoilers because I think okay. it does pay off. Maybe not as satisfactorily satisfactorily as you guys would probably want it to, but um, I think it does pay off in in a certain certain amount um, in the end. But I'll save that for spoilers. Andy, what were you gonna say? Um, I think I was just continuing to bounce off of mm-hmm. Brent's our, our our discussion about the uh, kind of the exposition and how much information we learned and that sort of thing. But, um, I, I liked, I think maybe what would have helped me is if, um, the kids on the phone did not explain themselves and who they are Mm -hmm. quite as much, like maybe because they're, you know, dead spirits or whatever, you know, uh, speaking from beyond the, the, realm of life i don't know um they're maybe they don't they don't understand where they are or how they're communicating so really all they can tell him is kind of broken fragments about you know what is going on in there and what they were trying to do to get out and then he maybe has to just piece together things on his own and as he's digging around in the basement maybe he figures out oh this is that kid um, you know, and it just felt a little bit maybe too like it was all just kind of procedurally handed to him, like, oh, mm-hmm. yep, I'm this kid, and this is what happened to me. Go look here. There's your answer. And I, I don't know. I think I just wanted more of Finney figuring it out for himself. Um, and I, I was pretty content with the amount of the grabber we got. I didn't need like more backstory or anything, even though yeah. earlier I was saying I kind of thought they were setting that up. Yeah. Um, I, I liked the mis- the mystery of the grabber and I think that made him creepier. Yeah, I, I agree with you there. And to touch on the point that you made earlier where um, you said that it, uh, that the phone calls kind of took away some of the agency of Finney, like that 
I definitely understand. Like, I definitely agree with that. <laughs> that it does feel, <laughs> it does feel like a video game kind of thing. Like, it kind of feels like he is in. It's, I don't know. I don't know. This might date me a little bit, but it's like, it's it's like if the movie were a video game. He has a game shark, or he has cheat codes, and like <laughs> <Yeah>. he <laughs> is like he's like, oh, okay. Well, I I don't know how to get past this. I'm going to Google how it is. Phone rings. Oh, okay. Dig under the uh dig under there or there's something mm-hmm. here so th- that is a little bit it does kind of lighten uh take it does take away from finney's journey in f- more than that i think is just the adding of gwen's whole arc and her whole her whole subplot with the with the dreams and everything that's the part that is the most kind of disappointing to me because it doesn't mm. connect with me quite not not nearly enough uh, to sustain the amount of uh, screen time it's given in comparison to Finney's uh, abduction and everything. It just felt it just felt like two different movies pushed together, a procedure, a procedural one and a um, just a child abduction one. And it just didn't really I don't know, didn't really mesh well with me. And I think that, that dragged it down a little bit, even though at the end of the day, I did really like the movie. But Mm -hmm. that was that was a big uh, um, distraction for me. Um, How did you guys feel about that whole subplot? Brent, go ahead. I I I liked it. I I would understand why, especially if it wasn't a part of the story or at all or a big part of the story. I could see why people like are like, why did they even add that in? Um, I. I liked it. It's a nice way to kind of work the problem from two ends, essentially. Mm-hmm. Um, I thought that actor, I thought she was probably the best of the child actresses, the the, the, actor, mm-hmm. the actress that played uh, Gwen. So, like, I just kind of liked, you know, her figuring it out. Um, in terms of the dream sequences, she almost kind of dreams in Super 8. <laughs> it's yeah. like kind of old, old super, <laughs> super stalker. So, Andy, have you seen Sinister? Because I know Matt, you said yes. you haven't. Yeah. Okay. Right. So it's it's very much in those kind of home movie, like mm-hmm. that aesthetic. Um, and actually the, the credits too in this are mm-hmm. very much like one of those home movies yeah. where the, the music especially is super creepy. It's like those like, it's like this weird, these weird like sub octaves using. Regardless, the the these sort of dream sequences she has to set up who the kid is, and she kind of sees all this stuff. Um, that reminded me a lot of Sinister. So again, that was kind of I, yeah. I liked seeing that. Where uh, again, that that kind of the um, it's it, it's really well, yeah. I don't. I mean. They're, they're kind of uh it's almost like like basically like snuff movies like that are in this yeah. other in sinister in this in this movie not in the black phone it really is just mm-hmm. a, a way to serve as kind of prologue to set up these characters yeah um but it did remind me like of dr sleep i know matt you know way more about stephen king than i do oh. and everything but it's that sort of like magical thing where it's like she's in the dream like the the kid who's doing the pinball thing he yeah. goes in the cover she goes with him and then you know she can they're like talking through the cop radio which mm-hmm. is the way for her to hear the conversation they're having through the black phone and stuff yeah. so uh yeah, I dug that stuff. I dug the existential crisis she's having. <laughs> where she's, <laughs> she's like, she's not existential, really, a religious crisis that she's having. Oh, yeah. Where she's, you know, she's just like, uh, you know, she's, she's well, after, uh, you know, Fane, you know, disappears. She's like on her knees and like all this stuff. And, you know, she's like, I never, I never pray. I'm praying all this stuff. And then she comes back the next day when she gets a dead end. Jesus, what the fuck? <laughs> that was great. It's just like, yeah, it's just like <laughs> she's really going through it, you know. I think that's yeah. a lot of what this movie is. It's like he's he's dealing with for something that no kid, of course, ever should have to right. go through. Uh, that's mm-hmm. terrible and horrible, more extreme stuff. She's going through this sort of like religious crisis early on, where she's like, okay, am I going to buy into this or not? Right. So like, I don't know. I just kind of I kind of liked this movie's approach to like again that trial by fire thing i mean they have an abusive dad they're they're Mm -hmm. they're forced to grow up way too fast in the wrong ways and i think this is a lot of this movie is them trying to really take control of their kind of young lives and kind of you know become adults the way they want to be if that makes any sense yeah that even though they're still young yeah Yeah. uh the abusive dad storyline was 
a little like it felt like it kind of felt like too much not 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 in terms of content but it just felt like too much plot <laughs> like too like okay we have this young girl who has these visions and then uh, like er, maybe i let would you guys want to go into spoilers <laughs> sure okay because I, I felt myself starting to kind of dance around it so okay okay we are <laughs> gonna go into spoilers for the black phone anything you guys want to say before we go into spoilers in terms of just broad overview of the black phone anything nope all right uh, yeah oh i, I dug it <laughs> oh nice <laughs> nice uh i did too so okay uh i'm gonna play a clip from the trailer when we come back we're gonna be spoiling the black phone so if you want to skip over it uh check the show notes for timestamps and everything but when we come back we're going to spoil the black phone i have an announcement to make one of our students finney blake was abducted what if i could help the police find finney Does it work? Not since I was a kid. I'll scream. I'll scratch your face. This face? Okay, so... Spoilers on for the Black Phone. Um, And I kind of want to touch on the belief thing, uh, or the, like, him believing in the phone and everything. And I just want to say that I think that the... I think the goal of the movie, and I, I and I admit that it doesn't really connect it that strongly, but I think that the the intention is that uh, the grabber just doesn't like the kid says that uh, he can hear the phone, he just doesn't believe it, or he just doesn't believe in it, or anything, he, or he can only hear it if he believes in it, or something something kind of hacky yeah. like that. To be honest, not hacky, but corny. Yeah. Um, and. Uh, by the end of it, he starts hearing the phone as he's being strangled. Um, and I think that that's the moment where he realizes like, oh, oh, okay. Something else has gone on here. Like this kid has been, this kid is special in some way. I think throughout the movie, he's kind of admitting that like, oh, there's something about him that's special or unique. And in that moment, he kind of realizes it. It's a very loose kind of connection and it and it isn't that pronounced in the movie or as pronounced as it should be but i just wanted to say that i think that that was the intention or at least that was my read of it yeah there's something about when he's strangling him with the phone that like one of the kids or multiple kids are like yelling at him or something like oh or the last thing you hear like something like that so yeah maybe that's what they're what the what the payoff was but yeah yeah i I, I just I, I know they set that up early on, and I'm like, oh man, that seems like that's going to be a real issue mm-hmm. if the grabber can also hear the phone, yeah, you know, with you, and then it wasn't. But he gets out, got a lot on his plate, so I'm glad the grabber couldn't hear it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Hmm. Uh, Andy, any thoughts on that? Uh, I I honestly don't know that I can add anything to that. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, the thing that I want to do uh kind of talk about in terms of its it it influence i guess is the casting of james ranson um he played i mean i know that he was also i I, I, my understanding is that he was also in sinister and he works with uh scott derrickson um occasionally i guess but um my my kind of thing was that it it really felt like i'm like i'm not i'm not i I'm not like a snob about Stephen King properties or anything. Like I know, like I have been, I've, I've talked a lot about how stranger things just feels a little bit like fan fiction in some places. Mm-hmm. Um, but <laughs> it, it's something that I, like, I, I understand the tone. I understand how appealing the tone is to have like, like such a hit as it was and then try to replicate that. And they do kind of replicate that here and there, but like I said, uh, Ethan Hawke's performance kind of separates it from being an, uh, an imitation or a ripoff. But in the casting of James Ranson and his his performance, it just really felt like it, it really felt like, OK, what if Eddie Kasprak, who he played in It Chapter Two, what if he was instead of like a. Um, a germaphobe guy what if he was a cokehead and he was in he was an adult in 1978 and then boom that's what we got and it just felt very 
uh, it just did not feel unique to me. And that kind of just bummed me out because I really like that actor. But the performance and the choices made, it just felt way too derivative for me. Did How did you guys feel about his about his performance and, and his inclusion in the movie? Um, I, I definitely get where you're coming from with his presence in it. I didn't necessarily think of it as, as derivative of anything in particular, but it did Mm -hmm. feel a little bit, I actually, when I was watching the movie, I, I recognized him. I knew I knew his face, Mm -hmm. but I didn't realize he was, uh, he played Eddie. Uh Um, but I did feel when he was kind of introduced and actually, at a certain point became a character in the story. Um, he felt almost at odds with the rest of the movie tonally. Yeah. Um, he was this kind of goofy eccentric, uh, you know, uh, kind of lighthearted conspiracy theorist wired person mm-hmm. who was going to try and solve this thing while he was living on top of it. Yeah. Um, and it, yeah, it, it didn't, feel like it really added anything especially when the rest of the movie is much darker and Mm -hmm. kind of creepy and brutal and hard-edged and then when he gets introduced it's like oh now this is like a cute little caper um but then of course um well, I guess now we're in spoiler territory. Then, of course, yeah. he gets, you know, his head caved in with an axe. And mm-hmm. it's just like, why was he here? <laughs> like, other yeah. than other than yeah. to make me feel sympathetic for this doofus of a dude mm-hmm. uh, right before he gets axed. Um, I don't know. It He felt like, I mean, he doesn't have much screen time, so I can't say mm-hmm. he really takes away from the movie that much. It yeah. just felt like a really weird and unnecessary inclusion. Yeah. Brent, what did you think? Uh, yeah, I think he can dump it. I think entirely. Mm-hmm. I, I think so. Uh, for like a little context, you're correct. He's in Sinister. Mm-hmm. So whatever, just like a quick thing. Ethan Hawke and James uh, uh, Ransone or Ranson, however he says his, his name. Uh, those the, the characters in that m- movie kind of form a bond, basically. Um, okay. James Ranson is like the uh, he's like the only police guy on that force that'll help him. Oh. So so he says um, James Ranson says you know at the end of your books you always think uh, deputy so and so or whatever he's like I can be deputy your deputy so and so so he calls him that <laughs> so like that's actually in his name in the movie and so nice. he's in Sinister <laughs> and he's also in Sinister too which is terrible. Oh, um, yeah. But he he's like the only holdover uh, from that movie. All the other characters that didn't, oh, wow. or all the other actors didn't uh, come out for because it. it's not good. Um, and Sam <laughs> Scott Derrickson, he didn't direct it, and mm-hmm. he might have produced it. Anyway, regardless, um, so he's in that as well. I so I always should have seen him really when I saw him. In fact, Aubrey and I turned to each other. We said deputy so and so. Like I don't know, <laughs> I don't know why because we just we're like apparently sinister freaks. I don't know nice. why, but anyway. But that so that actually was that. So I didn't really place him with. Um, with it, chapter two, even okay. though, you know, he was, he was good in that. I always think he's uh, Ziggy Sabatka from uh, season two of The Wire. Yeah, me, <laughs> so too. I was, me I, too. I've seen him in enough stuff where I, I kind of was able to, to decouple him. But, yeah. yeah, not only do I think he's a like a – it's I agree, like, tonally it's weird. And, yeah, he's sort of, like, doing some shtick. I mean, he's kind of – he's almost like the bumbling guys in uh, – is it the Conjuring movies that help uh, – oh, boy. Oh, um, getting off in the weeds here but anyway they kind of show up and they're one of them has glasses the other one's a little overweight it's all they're the kind of like a little comic duo within yeah. these horror movies yeah it might be the conjuring uh, conjuring or insidious i forget but regardless um i didn't have a problem with the casting or even necessarily the character but since we're in spoilers this makes zero sense <laughs> okay so all right so the grabber is a dude mm-hmm. he's a serial killer and abducts kids he has a brother who wears Hawaiian shirts and does cocaine and lives with him. <laughs> yeah. And he abducts kids, has abducted and killed multiple kids in this house, bury them in the house across the street, mm-hmm. since we're in spoilers, yeah. um, and is just there for whatever amount of time, knows generally his brother's whereabouts, like, oh, because he says, like, oh, he's at the grocery store or whatever. Mm-hmm. That's this whole conspiracy theory. And I think, is it maybe supposed to be funny that, like, oh, he's a conspiracy theorist and he thinks he has it all triangulated and figured out, but it's right under his... Like, is that supposed to be funny? Because, like, to me, it was just so stupid that yeah. he would that he would not know. And I understand it's soundproof. Like, I get mm-hmm. that. But, like, that is so stupid. I thought when they showed, when he was doing a line of cocaine and then the camera 
um, when it tilts down or, or dollies down or however you want to think of it, because you know, whatever. Mm-hmm. Um, like, I thought that was an editing trick where it's mm-hmm. like, oh, it, it makes it seem like, no, he's literally right, <laughs> right under him. And I'm like, when that paid out, when that we found that out, I'm like, that is so stupid. Yeah. Yeah. So, that I was, was like my big, that was literally like probably my biggest issue with the movie mm-hmm. that 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 character. And I think they would have done away with that. I probably would have liked that even more than I already did just because it's yeah. so. I, yeah. I kind of liked it. I will say that it is said that he's just crashing on, on the couch. And I think that it's an unexpected thing um, because Ethan Hawke comes down and he's like, oh, hey, I've got something going on. So I'll be down. I'll be down later to watch you sleep or whatever. And <laughs> uh, and then like. And maybe this is just me knowing the knowing the story because that's a, a small part of the story. It's changed around for the for the movie and everything. But um, like I think that maybe the movie didn't do a good enough job like expressing that oh he has a visitor and that visitor is his brother that's going to be crashing on the couch for a while um, because mm-hmm. it does throw a lot at us and it kind of gets a little jumbled there. Um, but I didn't really have a problem with that. It just seemed a little the whole like two houses thing felt. I get it, but I, I it felt like it was supposed to be like a it kind of felt like it was supposed to be like a malignant a malignant style twist or malignant sized twist. Well, in, you can't be malignant when it comes oh, to Oh I know. Twists. Oh I know. <laughs> but no, I'm like, but oh cool. I, He's got some real I estate. I get what you mean though, and that it, it felt like it was meant to be like a like a reveal, like a, oh yeah. this is how he pulled yeah. it off. And yeah. it was kind of just like Okay, I mean, if his brother is in his house while he's doing this, I would believe if he was burying them right there, you know, we're going to accept that. Oh, yeah. I don't really care where he's burying kids. (laughs) Um, So that was a little bit. And for that to also be like what the sister was tracking the whole time and didn't realize it. Yeah. Just felt like, okay, you didn't really help then. The whole (laughs) sister thing. Just... Oh my god, I'm sorry. Uh the whole sister thing just bothered me a little bit a little bit too much just because to my to my memory, to my knowledge, I don't think we saw like the first indication we have that she has these visions and she has these dreams is when the cops come to the school and talk to her and they're like, "Oh, you told this kid's uh sister that you dreamt about him and how did you know all this stuff?" It's like like we're playing catch up like I was at least I was like wait what there was I don't I didn't see this like what the hell this is a major plot point and you're introducing it to us with just dialogue and not I don't know it just felt very very clunky to me unless I missed something did I because the know. whole thing with her mom with the you know Gwen's mom and Jeremy Davis's you know, wife or, you know, whatever, like, yeah. like she had the gift and like, you know, but she died or whatever. Yeah. Or it's like that whole thing was so murky. And mm-hmm. I mean, I think Jeremy Davis, I think that stuff works earlier on uh, that scene where he's mm-hmm. like, you know, you know, just wailing on Gwen with the belt and everything. She's like screaming. She's like, Oh my gosh. And that's early on and everything. Yeah. You know, he's an alcoholic. I mean, that's the kind of stuff it's like, it's, it's a rough, movie i think it's a rough foundation mm-hmm. for that stuff so i think that stuff works but the stuff where jeremy davis is explaining that stuff and it's like wh- what is the deal with why she can do this i almost yeah. wouldn't i didn't care about any of that stuff i just would have been neither. fine if she had just was having these dreams and that is fine that is what it is i was scrolling through well actually well i guess i'll leave that point i was just you matt you had mentioned uh like it references mm-hmm. i was scrolling my notes and literally found another one hmm. uh which is like basically shots that there there's clearly okay so when glenn is biking through you know it's raining she has the yellow slicker oh, that's yeah. clearly an it thing so that's clearly yep. one um there was one where it was one of the dreams of one of the kids for uh, introducing one of the kids and the grabber who has black balloons which they say and everything hmm. there's ones where he has black balloons he has like a whole thing of them and they get really close that's another shot right, yeah. at, right at, at chapter two but there's a, even a third one that i was going that one of the kids is upside down like hanging like this or whatever yeah. and points to something that's totally the um where they have the what is it the, the deadlights or whatever uh, the deadlights hanging, yeah you know, the deadlights and that's from like chapter one the way it's visualized in chapter one is very different than of course the way it is in the right. mini series or anything so it's really right out of that so the, there's really like three shots at yeah. least that are like almost directly ripped from it so i 
Yeah, yeah. I, could, I could see where people would be a little bit miffed about that. Yeah, and that also doesn't really make much sense to me either. The like floating, kind of like in in the deadlights kind of thing, yeah. because. I think I remember when that, when that came up, I was like, wait, is there something like more supernatural to this man that's yeah. killing these kids? Because it's like, oh, I see. Yeah, it's like I, I didn't I didn't. Yeah, what really was that supposed to be that? representing in exactly. terms of like how that kid died or whatever? Like, yeah. Yeah. I all the other that's kids are just crazy. standing there. wounded. Right. You know, they have these gaping wounds on their bodies, but they're talking to him like they're still living people and then that one was just yeah. hanging upside down yep. in like a exorcist pose yeah, yeah. Ex- exactly the classic possessed pose there, yeah. the, in terms of the i agree totally with what you said matt the way that they, they use the room and mm-hmm. and the kids like being right out of uh, you know sight line it, it's it's cool way to kind of visualize these these audio conversations but yeah. the um with Robin where he's showing him to like how to, how to basically punch with the phone. And once he packs yeah. a folder, like that was cool. I don't know exactly how they timed that if they were actually mm-hmm. there or whatever, but it looks neat. <laughs> like I didn't know yeah. if it was practical or not the way that they were both pretty much like in snap, like it just looked really good. So I, I thought that was the most, the best yeah. of all of those scene sequences. I loved that too. And, and I really liked the way that the movie tries to kind of put everything together. Like all the kids, voices together like i mean we had mm-hmm. that like scene with uh the baseball the baseball kid that is like that's like oh yeah you know your arm is mint uh it's like oh his arm is mint and then yeah, <laughs> it, like it's it's a little silly but it's also kids so i'm like okay fine um yeah. but yeah i kind it's of a bit of a stand like, by me sort of thing to this movie mm-hmm. too if we're talking about bit, stephen yeah. king oh you yeah know, so yeah yeah and even dr sleep with the baseball kid now that i think about it um mm-hmm. yeah yeah there was dr sleep with the gwen stuff i was thinking of a lot oh yeah i was thinking of the oh boy i don't remember that movie as well as you map but there's <laughs> there's basically the younger uh the uh character mm-hmm. uh the younger female character yeah. is she ends up being really powerful like mm-hmm. it, it kind of reminded me of her but anyway totally i don't oh, remember yeah. that movie as well as i should but <laughs> yeah yeah um, um, I would yeah. just say one, one other thing I would just say about like all the traps, I, since we're in spoilers, mm-hmm. uh, like for me, I like the way everything came together. This sounds like a hokey message, but it's mm-hmm. basically these little things that he's doing that seems like he's adding up failures, right? Yeah. Like he's trying to get out through the freezer, you know, you know, he can't do that, but he grabs the meat. He tries to go out through the window, but and with the rope and the cable and all that stuff, he pulls the grate off and it's like, great. Oh, mm-hmm. uh-huh. <laughs> so, you know, like all these things. But like, as we see, it's like this. It's all these little pieces of the puzzle that end up, you know, allowing him to to get the upper hand. So yeah. it's a bit of a hokey message. But I would say that it's kind of like, you know, the, oh, God, I can't believe I'm ref- referencing this meme. But it's no, I shouldn't even say that. The guy digging and the diamonds are right there and he's like whatever it's like don't give up you know it's like that sort of thing where yeah. it's, it's like you have the pieces of your escape here you just have to use your like yeah. in these little bits of only one conversation you had with each of these kids like you have the information mm-hmm. but you just have to put it together um it's a little silly when you when i say it like that but like i think <laughs> in the movie visually and everything i i, I think it's i like it I think it's good. <laughs> yeah, I, I get uh, like I agree. It's it's a fun little but also pretty hokey message. But also in yeah. in contrast to that, something that in and, and then we can kind of wrap up this because we still have to talk about Cha Cha Real Smooth. But um, <laughs> but the uh, in contrast to that, we have uh, the father character being abusive and very angry and 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 an alcoholic and everything and beating beating Gwen like just mercilessly and then when he's delivering that like that exposition dump about the mother and how she had visions mm-hmm. too and she ended up killing herself because of it and he just doesn't want her to end up the same way it felt like it felt weirdly gross to me that it's like mm-hmm. okay so okay so it's okay that he just beat the shit out of his young daughter <laughs> because he's saving yeah. her it felt very weird to me and yeah. I don't know. I feel like there's something there that could have been, they could have made it more of a connective, like, 
or, or symmetrical experience between like her experience with their dad and Finney's experience with the grabber and kind of put those together in some way, but it just doesn't really do that. And the, I think the meaning behind it kind of falls by the wayside or, or any kind of resonance kind of falls by the wayside. And what we get is like a, I'm only beating you because I don't want you to kill yourself <laughs> kind of <laughs> weird thing. And then yeah. when he's saved, yeah. it's like, Oh, I'm, I'm a good father now. It's like, okay, that's, that, that doesn't compute. Yeah, it it really felt that whole the whole subplot with the dad, the whole presence of the dad, mm. really felt like Scott Derrickson or whoever just didn't had no idea what to do with that or what to yeah. try and say with it. But they wanted to have it there for emotional gravity in some yeah. vague way. Because yeah, the the degree to which they really go for it with mm. that first kind of abuse scene yeah. is very brutal and hard to watch and you're like oh my gosh this is you know this is terrible you really take it seriously from that point on and then kind of the next time we get yeah. significant time with him is him having that almost sympathetic scene where he's yeah. like well yeah. your mom you know your mom had a serious problem that she couldn't you know it, it was a condition and she couldn't overcome it and it killed her and yeah. i don't want that for you and it's like wait a minute now he's like that's act it, it's gross but it's also taken on its own like a reasonable motive like i understand <laughs> why he doesn't want his daughter to indulge in this but also he just beat her within an inch of her life and he's also yeah. like gaslighting her into not helping her brother um and then the end of the movie, when he shows up again after all is well, it's this really vague, like, is he forgiven? Is yeah. Are they rejecting him? Is Are we supposed to feel bad for him? Are we <laughs> supposed to hate him? And it just is this big mess of different conflicting messages. So I think they could have. Yeah, I think I think what uh, I think it was Brent, you mentioned kind of they should have tried to parallel her relationship with her dad with the grabber and Finney or something drive that home more. But yeah, yeah. that, that could have been a way to somehow have something in that parallel storyline that isn't just her dreaming or whatever. Um, yeah. I agree with you, Eddie. I think they just, I think they just don't really know what to do with that character yeah. more down the stretch. I think that's, I think that, abu I mean, I think that that's a, it's a hard scene to watch, but it's a mm -hmm. it's a good scene for you to mm -hmm. understand their relation. Even earlier on, you know, he's the first scene he cracks the paper and, you know, she the bread box or something drops too fast. And she's like, sorry, mm -hmm. you know, and it's like that's really tense and everything. Yeah, I think uh, another uh, it reference. I think what they were maybe trying to go for is the Bev and her dad relationship. Mm -hmm. And yeah, it, where I forget that character's name. But I think that is done better in like it chapter one and it, like in the book too. I mean, it's it's super creepy and just oh, a yeah. part of all of that. But um, yeah, I think they just they don't really know what to do with him outside of that that really hard to watch scene of uh, abuse. I almost wish they just had either. I agree with you. I'd either have him flesh that out more where it doesn't make him sympathetic where they're having this heart to heart or whatever, mm. or just don't have him at all yeah. and pass that early scene and just say, we're getting out of the house and like, yeah. you know, you audience don't have to see that again. We right. don't have to deal with it. Just know that about their traumatic backstory and then, okay, fine. You can hug him at the very end, but we're not having any of this. Like, yeah. you know, Oh, he's, trying to do his best and you know whatever yeah, yeah, maybe i've seen yeah. where he's licking the vodka up and getting shards of glass on his tongue i mean maybe have that but that's like the most you know yeah, yeah. It, it would have been a lot better to just after that initial kind of those tense kind of abusive scenes at the beginning to then just kind of a, well that's established at that point okay the home life is shit they have nowhere to go when right. everything goes south you know yeah. like his sister has no one to turn to, so she has to do this on her own kind of thing. Right. Yeah. But yeah. Yeah. It, yep. uh, at best it's kind of messy for me. So yeah. Yeah. Um, any kind of other thoughts that we haven't touched on with, uh, in spoilers or any, any thoughts on the black phone and overall? I'm 
pretty tapped out on uh, on takes on the black phone i think <laughs> nice. my only other take is uh i like the use of on the run by pink floyd which oh, starts yeah. out of the movies i released in 73 i think so mm. that's uh also you know, like period accurate well they had other they had other 70s songs but on the runs a neat like it's the instrumental do it do it do it do it do it from uh you know with the, the synth going and that's such like a propulsive i don't know it works for a movie like this where like yeah. multiple threads are coming together towards the end so anyway i thought that was cool oh yeah <laughs> absolutely um all right so uh what did you guys rate it on letterboxd and then we can go on to we can we can uh turn to the left and talk to talk about <laughs> cha-cha real smooth or take it back now y'all yeah <laughs> Um, I believe I gave the black phone two and a half out of five on Letterboxd. Brutal. <laughs> a much more generous three out of five for me. Uh, not as good as Sinister, but uh, definitely a, a solid horror movie that, uh, yeah, definitely had some structural issues like we talked about, but overall I liked it a lot. Nice. Uh, I just looked <laughs> As often happens with the podcast, I... you gave it a five out of five, didn't you? No, no, no. I gave it a four <laughs> out of five, and I think in the okay. process of talking about it, I talked, I've, You've I've talked, talked myself down, down a little bit. to like a three point five <laughs> out of five because I still enjoyed it, but it does have some some issues and some uh, heavy lifting to do, I guess. So, yeah. well, I'm just glad that. You know, I could make us all agree that it's a terrible movie. Yep. <laughs> I'm down to three and a half, down to a three out of five. So, yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Andy. Yeah. Yes. Oh yeah. All right. Well, that's our review of the Black Phone, and we're gonna kind of round out the episode with a review of the new. Uh, oh my God, Con- uh, Connor Cooper Rafe. Rafe. Cooper Rafe. Cooper. Uh, Cooper, Cooper Rafe. Rafe. Uh, film Cha Cha Real Smooth, which is currently on Apple TV Plus, starring Cooper Rafe and Dakota Johnson. Uh, Mm -hmm. The plot summary, courtesy of IMDb, is a young man who works as a bar mitzvah party host strikes up a friendship with a mother and her autistic daughter. Again, this is uh, this this movie, I believe, premiered at Sundance to, to some good acclaim and is now on Apple TV Plus. So, uh, you guys, what did you think about Cha Cha Real Smooth? Of course, non spoiler, and then we'll go into spoiler. Um, I really liked Cha Cha Real Smooth. Um, I I had a lot of fun with it, and I liked that it was kind of simultaneously a movie that was willing to, um, be emotionally tough and awkward and uncomfortable but also Mm -hmm. still kind of ultimately a comfort film in like a really roundabout way um and i like that about um rafe's two movies so far that they're vulgar and weird and a little bit awkward at times and kind of uh cringy in that intentional way you know Mm -hmm. not like oh this is bad cringy but like Oh, this is hard to watch because it's too real cringy. Um, and then ultimately still be movies about warmth and understanding and that sort of thing. Um, so I liked it. I, I, I don't think it's perfect, but I do think I enjoyed his first one shit house. Mm-hmm. Um, I thought that was a pretty decent movie. And I think this is a, a like an upgrade from that. I think is a, another step towards, you know, um, great filmmaking from Cooper Rafe. Nice. Well said. Um, Brent, how about you? Uh, yeah, I think it was solid. I saw this, uh, yeah, at, uh, back virtually at Sundance in January or February, and mm-hmm. yeah, we watched it earlier this month, and uh, I think it's solid. I, I think, and I don't care how we say it from here on out, I think he actually might pronounce his name Rife. Oh, oh really? Which looks weird. Which looks weird. Yeah. Like it shouldn't be that. But I was listening, I think, to film spotting mm-hmm. like, earlier this month, and I think they did an interview. And but it doesn't really matter. Uh, well, I mean, it does to him. <laughs> 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 and big fans of Cooper Rafe Rife. Yeah. Um, what are we without our names? After this? <laughs> that is so true. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I think. Yeah, I, so I had to like awkwardly tiptoe around. I write for a publication called What's Up, and mm-hmm. like I can't say shit house in. Oh uh, yeah, I can't say that in the mm-hmm. article. So I, I just like couldn't really talk about that movie. I didn't <laughs> want to say like, oh, like his first feature. I was just like, we're just not going to talk about it. We're going to scrap it. They don't uh, even want you to like put like S H asterisk T house or anything. I like don't that. know. I probably could have, but oh, okay. I just. I made it a challenge for myself, <laughs> nice. just, you know, even though I think it's, it, it's, it's a good, uh, definitely good reference point for it. Um, but, 
Yeah, I think this is... I think this movie definitely... Um, you know, it succeeds or fails based on what you... How you feel about him as a performer mm-hmm. and kind of what he's bringing to this. Yeah. Um, there's a certain kind of charisma and charm where it's 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 boyish for, like... It's 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 very boyish, and then it's sometimes like very um, like I I don't know like he, he kind of he can he can turn on the charm and then turn it right into like flirting like pretty great and like in mm-hmm. in ways that are I don't know that I think I don't know I think people I think either he'll win you over or he won't with this movie and he won me over and it sounds like generally I mean he won the won the Sundance audience over it won the uh, audience award for for dramatic competition. So yeah, I think there, it's a lot in his, um, yeah, just, just his, his screen presence and Mm -hmm. how he, the movie ultimately is just kind of all about him and like all all about these other characters and how they're going to kind of help him and everything. And I could see people being turned off on that. And Mm -hmm. I, I like the movie, but I would say, the test for me with, with Cooper is going to be what he's going to do with his next movie. And if he's in it, is he going to be the main character and is everyone going to kind of exist in the movie to serve him? Cause if, if he's going to keep doing that, I think I could get old pretty quick. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think he's going to have to find other ways sort of around that. But having said that, I, I like this movie a lot and I, you know, Dakota Johnson's really good in it. She uh, co-produced it as well. And mm-hmm. I think the cast too, this has a, uh, a more well-known cast than you know Shadow's previous movie, so so I agree with you. Eddie. In in some ways, it's definitely a step up. Yeah, I so I never saw Shithouse and I was kind of bummed because when I was watching Cha Cha Real Smooth, I was like, oh, I'm going to make this like a double feature. I'm going to watch Shithouse after this. And like it wasn't it was streaming forever on Prime Video, but it's not streaming anywhere now. But um, I'm going to have to go back and and watch it now. But um. I saw, I thought I saw somewhere on Letterboxd that, uh, Cooper Rife is referred to in one review somewhere, um, as kind of playing up this, like, kind of like, like a male equivalent of the Manic Pixie Dream Girl kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And, and you're right, Brent, it is very focused on him. And, like, it, it very much won me over as well. Like, the charm, like, um, I would say that, uh, this Cooper guy is rife with charm, um, um and charisma and, uh, but I hope he, I'm right about that. His last name pronunciation. I know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, either way. Yeah. <laughs> but um but yeah i was just very taken with with his performances like i am i'm someone who is a sucker for like a good coming of age story and a good like arrested development like man child Mm -hmm. growing up kind of story and while he doesn't really fit that archetype terribly well he does but it, it kind of he spins this charismatic he puts this charismatic spin on it in such a way that it just really made me uh made me kind of just like his journey and when it gets to his uh friendship and relationship with uh with uh, Dakota Johnson's character i i really like the way that he his attitude and his um his persona it, it kind of like it felt like the shields were coming down a little bit and he became more more uh not three dimensional but more uh tailored to an adult kind of relationship in in some respects and then uh we'll talk in spoilers about what all happens in it but i just really kind of appreciated the the trajectory that his character went through and and uh and i thought that he did a fine job in every uh, everything as a as a performer but if it's if it's the same kind of thing as he did in shit house i do agree brent that with his next movie, I would want something different if he is in it because, mm-hmm. uh, yeah. But having not seen Shit House, I I don't know. But yeah. Anyway, yeah. yeah I think I, to to make the oh I'm sorry uh, to to make the connection to Black Phone. I'm trying to make all these connections to <laughs> movie two movies that don't do anything with each other. He's doing like well, not like Ethan Oxbro, but but Shit House reminded me a lot of Before Sunset. Okay. Um, and mm-hmm. it's sort of like where. I mean, he's kind of like doing not Ethan Hawke's character, but he's like kind of the Ethan Hawke cyber in that. But but his performance in Shit House, Cha Cha, real smooth are are not terribly different. Okay. Um, the 
I'm sorry, I forget the actress from Shit House, but basically the the um, you know the, the young woman that he's having the kind of conversation with the majority of the night um, mm-hmm. is a very different foil than Dakota Johnson, you okay. know, or potential whatever. So, th- so it's a different kind of movie in terms of like form and and just how they're sort of discovering each other. It's different than Cha Cha Real Smooth, but his performance is is not very different. Um, he's still a young guy, and he's like 24, 25. So yeah. I don't mean to be too hard on like like oh he should be. You know, you gotta be like going like Brando now, go full oh, right. method or go full Leto, go full Morbius. <laughs> yeah. You know, I, it's like you know, I'm just saying that if he's gonna, you know, whatever, can you like write and direct in these movies? If he's gonna continue to star in them, that's cool. And like, I mean, he can even would be the starring role, fine. But I, I just think if he runs into this trap where it's the third time around, it's this similar thing of like mm-hmm. kind of all about me. It's like I think I think that's yeah. really gonna wear on people. Um, so, yeah, I, I think um, two movies in, he's still very much in like a safe zone for me with this kind yeah. of repeated uh, structure of director star um, playing a very likable character. Um, and it worked for me both times. And I think it actually has worked for me better in Cha Cha Real Smooth than in Shithouse, in which I think he's maybe intentionally not quite as likable of a character, a much more flawed and impulsive person in mm-hmm. shit house than in this. Um, although he's still definitely flawed here. Um, but I, I agree. I hope that with his third movie, he either, well, or whatever he does next, I hope he either directs, directs somebody else in the lead or stars in somebody else's project. Mm. Um, just because I like, I like his acting and I like his writing and directing and I would like to see those applied in different ways. Um, Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm definitely with you guys. I think it's worked so far. He's young and he's telling the stories that I assume feel like a part of him Mm -hmm. or that he can put a part of himself into. I don't know to what degree he's experienced the things in these movies, but it feels very much like young guy of this current generation telling stories of this current generation coming into their own as adults. And so for me, it does not, it it doesn't wear out. It's welcome over the course of these two movies, but I I agree that I would like to see some kind of variation, whether that's in, in his contribution to the move to his next project or in the subject matter or the, the type of character he plays. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it definitely does feel like, and again, I only have this movie to as a frame of reference, but it does feel like a personal kind of uh, movie that he's he's written mm-hmm. and, and made and everything. So, um, I don't know. I I, I liked it. <laughs> yeah. I'll say that. Um, yeah. Do you guys want to jump into spoilers uh, and give like a? Um, and then the dragon come. Oh, we're not. Oh yeah. <laughs> Shit. <laughs> Uh, but yeah, but before we go into spoilers, any kind of overall thoughts on it or anything, uh, before we jump in? Um, sure. I'll give kind of my main point I'd like to make on it. Sans spoilers is I've seen a lot of people bristling at the movie for kind of the thing we've talked about of, uh, this dude, uh, playing what seems to be kind of a variation of himself Mm -hmm. in a movie that he directed and wrote, And he's kind of the ideal guy in a lot of ways and every other character likes him. And uh, for a certain portion of the movie, it's kind of like anybody who doesn't like him is portrayed as an asshole. Yeah. Um, Although when we get into spoiler territory, I'll discuss why I didn't have as much of an issue with that. Mm -hmm. Um, But I guess my response to kind of a lot of that push pushback would be that this movie winds up being all about um, empathy and all about kind of being able to see beyond yourself and your own desires and impulses and seeing how everybody's just kind of trying to make it. And so are you. And even if you're a really good person and everybody likes you, you're not always your best self. Mm hmm. Um, but that's, that's why we have relationships with each other. That's why he has all these relationships that are touched on throughout the movie. These are people who you have in your life to remind you how to be your better self. And I, I like that about this movie. Nice. Very well said. Yeah, I agree. Um, 
yeah all right anything before we go into spoilers anything else last call okay nope all right, I'm going to play a clip from the trailer for Cha-Cha Real Smooth, and then we are going to go into spoilers for the movie. Who's that? That's a mom and kid. Do you two dance? We're not feeling it right now. How about I bet you $300 I can get her on the dance floor? I will give you $1,000. I want you to take me to Want you take me to She really likes you. I really like her. Tonight is the night that you and Lola dance your booties off. Oh, I don't know how to moonwalk. <laughs> so, spoilers on for Cha Cha Real Smooth. And uh, how did you guys feel about the relationship between uh, him and the child that I can't remember her name? Uh, Lola. Lola. Yeah. yeah. How did you feel about that and the dynamic between him and Dakota Johnson's character? Yeah, I think I think it works very well. Yeah, Vanessa Burkhardt is the mm -hmm. uh, name of the actress who plays Lola. Who my understanding is she is uh, she is autistic as as her character is, and uh, yeah, I, I like the relationship a lot. It's the thing is like, and I don't know how to like say this. There's a certain like there's a certain charm to this character that it's almost like if he was a real person, I would like. I wouldn't trust it. Like he's almost too he's good. Like, suspicious. Like, yeah. yeah, he's suspicious. Like, like he has this like great relationship with his brother, mm -hmm. and he's being like cutesies and I offering you know, like all these tips to him, and uh, he's like he knows just like the thing to say, like just how to act with mm -hmm. um, the autistic daughter, and he like knows like how to like flirt with Dakota Johnson and like make out with her, but not have mm -hmm. the fiance who's away on work, like all this stuff. And it's just like like I would hate this dude in real life, but <laughs> in the context of this movie, like. It works because there are, he does have like he has like a fight with his brother and he says like you know he's just mean to him he's just a mm -hmm. dick to him he's a dick to his stepdad um, played by um, I almost said Bradley Cooper oh. <laughs> <laughs> Brad Garrett yeah. uh, Brad Garrett uh, <laughs> you know so you know he has like this he has a great relationship with his mom you know and all this stuff Leslie mm -hmm. Mann and who doesn't have a name. Uh, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. she's Andrew's mom, mom. <laughs> that's, how, that's how she's credited in the, in the movie mm -hmm. uh, and has like a really good scene with her you know towards the end where he's yeah. just like I just wanted to thank you for raising me and again like it sounds so precious but I don't know there's something about the way he's able to do it it's that line of sincerity and but, like I believed yeah. it mm -hmm. I believe that he was not just Cooper Ray, but like the character like that that's genuine but i could yeah. see some people being like what are you trying to pull over yeah so. like it, it does come across as a little it's it's like an and and that and this is why i think it's uh it feels like a personal thing it feels like an idealized version of or vision of like who he wants to be or who he is sure. maybe um i don't know if that's fair or not but it just feels like this idealized like human being that like he he has like his conf like he has his feelings toward uh Dakota Johnson and everything but it feels like the movie is intentionally made to where almost like a vanity piece where it's like look how great this guy is look how just amazing and personable and respectful <laughs> he is to his mother and to uh, like and he does have like even those like bits of conflict and and drama or those the things where he doesn't uh like i i one of you mentioned this that like anytime i think brent you said that uh anytime someone is presented as uh uh disagreeing with him or not liking him is portrayed as an asshole and it kind of feels like it just it just feels a little bit uh, something is off kilter with it like something doesn't really uh it it doesn't feel like a fully formed character even though his character is incredibly charismatic and very fun to watch i'm just waiting yeah. for him to pull up with a black van and some black balloons and a mask and steal a kid <laughs> <laughs> um i think this crowd will appreciate this it's that uh line from lower expectations by bo burnham mm -hmm. if you think this guy only exists in your mind well guess what you're right yeah. you know it's like it's kind of like a the, the key, like the key line to kind of unlock this character and kind of this whole movie is uh, when he's he, either t no, he's drunk. 
with uh, Dakota uh, Johnson and they're outside and they're like having conversation or whatever. And he's like, I know how to soft step. I just don't want to right now. Mm-hmm. And that, that like that to me is such like an insight into his character is like part of it is sort of a game. Like he knows how to work conversations. He knows how to work people. But part of it is also genuine connection to an empathy, as you mentioned, Andy. I do think that's it's all kind of messy. It's part of it. He's still figuring himself out. But that's that's kind of a way that line to me sort of bridges the sort of boyish charm with the sort of uh, I don't know how to say the other thing, but, you know, the other thing (laughs) where he's like kind of uh, kind of the less ideal version of himself. Yeah, like a a bit of a stinker. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Stinker. I'm leaving it there. <laughs> I uh I think this movie and his performance um really threads the needle very well. I I totally get the things you guys are touching on and and the other takes that I've read that are far more negative about mm-hmm. the movie and about his character that, you know, the character feels in some ways too good to be true and like an idealized yeah. version of himself. I think it it rides that line really well um mostly because of where it all goes in the end i think like Mm -hmm. if you were to watch this movie and you know get about halfway through and you're like okay this is too you know this guy's too likable puts me off he's sus turn off the movie can't do it anymore (laughs) totally get that Mm -hmm. but i think like the more the movie unfolds the more you see that you know he is a really good guy, but he also has his own selfish impulses that, Mm -hmm. you know, everybody has and even really good people indulge. Um, and, and, you know, I, I think it's something that I found special about this movie that other people might find annoying is that we have a main character who, I don't know, maybe it's just so many movies nowadays we're, we're so used to main characters like not being super likable or having like really mm-hmm. heavily emphasized flaws. And the whole movie mm-hmm. is kind of about their flaws rather than about their strengths yeah. um, outside of like Captain America or Superman, <laughs> you know, where they are literally the epitomized version of the ideal man. Um, <laughs> we're not used to, to human dramas with characters who are already very good from the start. And, yeah. and, something I liked about this movie is that at so many different in so many different relationships and at so many different turns he is a cool guy he genuinely cares about Lola he's not just babysitting Lola to get with her mom you know he really cares about Lola he's a I mean most of the time a great older brother Um, Mm -hmm. he's you know he loves his mom dearly yes he's a dick to his stepdad but Mm -hmm. it's kind of for a while played off as kind of just you know jovial tension yeah. it gets a little uglier later um but i i think what i liked so much is that it builds him up as this genuinely very good person and then kind of starts sn- uh almost snowballing his flaws and his his indulgence of his own selfish desires um and then kind of ends it out with a more positive note of where, where he's kind of reminded that oh yeah i was kind of losing my way there mm-hmm. um i it's it's time to get up back on track and be the good guy that i can be or that i should be um so it worked really well for me um i do think were this to be a trend that continues in his next project or projects it will get tiresome and he will run out of avenues to take it and it will start to feel more like a vanity project. But this for me felt definitely, I I think it, it steered just shy of feeling vain. Yeah. And I mean, probably after his next movie, he'll be scooped up by like Marvel or something anyway. So he'll be in that machine (laughs) anyway. So (laughs) it doesn't matter what he does after that. But, um, yeah, there was something I I and I'm I'm putting myself out there cuz I'm not sure if I'm going to sound like an idiot cuz maybe I misread something or maybe I didn't pay close enough attention, but it kind of felt like it kind of felt like by the end with in that scene where Dakota Johnson's uh fiance um mm-hmm. yeah, like Joseph. Yeah. When he when he like thanks him for um protecting his family for for family. him and all mm-hmm. that. Yeah. Like that felt like 
that kind of felt like the moment where uh where cooper's character andrew um where he kind of it's kind of a window into like oh this is how it, it takes away his idealism both of like for the audience i guess and for him in his idealized like lifestyle or look look at the world um in his relationship with dakota johnson and it's kind of showing that like the like more adult relationships are a lot more complex and complicated than than what's on the surface so he's he's kind of like trying to it's it's presenting the movie is presented as kind of like this uh this charismatic guy wooing this this woman in a committed relationship away from it when having this kind of um this whole this whole thing where it's like okay she's not happy in this relationship so she's supposed to be with him but then that kind of comes to a head at the end when he just kind of realizes like oh wait it's not sur- the surface level of that is it's it's not as clear cut and there's more uh complications and and more complexity to human relationships than what he has thought of i don't know maybe i'm just i'm kind of spitballing there did did that kind of come across to you guys at all or am i talking completely out of my my own shit house um, no i <laughs> no i i 100 felt that as per, yes. exactly in that scene the mm-hmm. the scene where joseph comes to confront him at his car because and i'm i'm going back to what i was talking about earlier how some people have reacted to this film kind of negatively in how it paints the people that are at odds with andrew as mm-hmm. bastards yeah. That scene was kind of the breakthrough scene of the movie that where it kind of reveals itself to not be all sunshine and rainbows about, yeah. you know, okay, Andrew's the good guy, everybody else is the, the asshole. Um, I think what you were getting at there is mm-hmm. that that's kind of where the movie drops Andrew's lens. We're kind of watching the whole movie and the events through Andrew's perspective. Mm-hmm. Um, and then up until that point, you know, Joseph is kind of he's a background character but we're kind of led to believe you know Joseph is a jealous protective husband he's mm-hmm. going to be or fiance um he's going to be an asshole to Cooper at every chance he or at to Andrew at every chance he gets and then when he realizes what's going on Andrew's like hey I mean he doesn't say it in these words but it's kind of like a I get it it's fine mm mm-hmm. mhm you're a dumb kid. You know, yeah. Andrew says, I'm a dumb kid. And he's like, yeah, I know. <laughs> like, I get it. It It's fine. And it's like, okay, Joseph's not an evil villain. Yeah. He's a dude <laughs> who is engaged to be married to a woman and isn't thrilled <laughs> that this 22 year old or 24 year old is flirting with her. Like, yeah. okay, this is all real life again now. Um, and I kind of like that that starts to happen with all the relationships. We start to see the yeah. other person's, side of things and and we see how andrew's kind of coming up short in a lot of his relationships much better yeah, said they, than i <laughs> well yeah i mean i get what you guys are saying about joseph i think there's just something there that i just couldn't what i couldn't get a read on is how much does he understand what's going on mm-hmm. like does he understand like okay what does he think like he i feel like he I feel like it's made known that he understands there's something going on between Andrew and Domino. Like he mm-hmm. gets that, but it's like, okay, was well, he going to do anything about it? Like, yeah. it's just like, there's just kind of this, te- there's this tension between them, which would make sense and makes total mm-hmm. sense to mm-hmm. me. And I, that scene that you're talking about in the car, you're right. is absolutely a pivotal scene. Mm-hmm. And it's a way that they're, he's, we're, you're right. Where we don't see Joseph as the villain of the movie because he's not. Right. You know, he's uh, he, he's he's yeah, this guy, <laughs> fiance and everything, and you know he, that she kind of cheating on him anyway. Yeah. So, <laughs> um, I don't know. I, I guess I don't know what I wanted from that. I think I just wanted maybe a little more insight into. It's almost like he's seen this movie before. Like I could see his character saying that this movie mm-hmm. isn't meta like that, but like like. You know, oh, he's the the young guy, you know, he's away on work all the time. So mm-hmm, she's yeah. going to go look for a boy toy or whatever and all this stuff. And it's like, OK, so if he's seen this movie, quote unquote, like, what is he going to do about it? I don't know. I just yeah. couldn't. That was just a tough thing for me to square. But I think ultimately it it works. Like there's that one scene where he's like, hey, what's wrong with you, man? You're always so serious or something like that. Mm-hmm, and Andrew's yeah. 
says that to Joseph. You yeah. know, it's almost like that's that soft step line I was talking about. Like, there's certain times where he'll kind of get these jabs in, you know, but then he'll kind of be able to walk it back and people don't really necessarily see him as a threat. Um, so, so I don't know. Yeah, I, I agree that it's it's a good way for him to step outside of his box. Um, I just that Joseph character is just sort of I don't know. I don't think he was. It's just the amount that we see him. It's something I feel like is almost like doesn't quite add up to me with that character. Yeah. Um, but I like yeah. I like the resolution. I like the um, the scene where you know Brad Brad Garrett's character. Uh, you know they they get into the. The fight. Uh, fight and uh, mm-hmm. Leslie Mann gets gets punched and then you know Brad Garrett's protecting her and then and then Andrew's like you know you know he he likes that he he respects that he stood up for her and all that stuff I don't know it's like that good scene in the car it's like kind of good family vibes and all that so yeah, yeah. I like that he kind of he gets that you know I don't necessarily have to have a personal relationship with Greg but um you know, I'm I'm gonna have respect for him out of respect for my mom because Greg makes my mom happy and protects yeah. her and is there for her. And I like, mm-hmm. yeah, I like that. Sure. That's where he goes with it. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Um, anything else? Is the Casper slide in this movie? Is the what? Oh, the, the song. The song is the movie. Oh, the yeah, same. I think it is. Right? It is. It's, okay. it's played. I know that right. Wap, I know that Wap is in it as well. Oh um, yeah. I think, I think this is the first movie that I heard that song in. In okay. that song, that song came out in you know twenty like oh, fall yeah. of twenty twenty something like that. If it's been in other movies, I just forget. But this yeah. is the first one that I remember seeing, and I was like, all right. Yeah, it's down with the kids. Yeah, the <laughs> inclusion of WAP has one of my favorite of Cooper's line deliveries in this movie. I think he has a lot of really great line delivery line reads in this movie. Just I don't know. There's something about <laughs> his dryness and the way yeah. he just kind of yeah. holds on to things and lets them slip out of his mouth. <laughs> but um, it, it's in the that WAP scene where he's of course a you know a you know professional party starter or whatever they call it. Mm-hmm. Um, they did conductor. Yeah, yeah. making everybody yeah. have a good time and getting paid <laughs> for it um and uh yeah he's kind of introducing the next song and he goes we've, we've got one more it's called wop and you can just see even though oh, it doesn't yeah. cut to anybody it's still on his face you can just like picture all the parents like what yep <laughs> oh yeah i like his conflict with and this is how the final fight starts, but it's even earlier on where basically he's like your kid, your kid's being a bully. Mm-hmm. All these like all these like awful. I don't want to say yuppie parents, but whatever that he like yeah. has no problem confronting at these bar and bat mitzvahs. <laughs> oh yeah, that he's just like you know he's like uh, my son is being a good son. And it's like uh, actually no, he's being a little shit. You know? Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> I actually like that that like he's that intermediary between like. No, this kid's being terrible. You're going to stand up for him, and no, <laughs> you know? I I, I like that a I lot that. too. Yeah, because <laughs> ultimately, I, I think what I'm going, I should have uh, yeah, watched rewatch this together for this, but I, that's ultimately what starts the final fight. <laughs> like it's a video game, the the fight that <laughs> ends up uh, where Brad Garrett guy and that's being the final punch. action and, scene, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> final final boss level, cha cha. <laughs> Um, no, yeah, the, his dynamic with the parents, I loved that. And I think that's another one that I could see a lot of people kind of, you know, turning their nose up at like, oh, mm-hmm. he's, you know, really being disrespectful to these parents about their kids or whatever. But I, I, my mom was a teacher, she's a retired teacher. Um, and one of the big things that she would kind of, um, you know, uh, malign in, in her later career was how parenting kind of changed Mm -hmm. in the more recent generations and how it went from being like parent and teacher working together to instruct and discipline Mm -hmm. the kid Mm -hmm. to 
uh, teacher versus kid and mm-hmm. parent, and uh. the parent just <laughs> refusing to believe that the kid could have done something wrong. And so oh, that geez. that stuff just really came through in those scenes to me where we see the kid in question being an asshole. Yeah. And Cooper mm-hmm. calls him out on being right. an asshole, and the parent <laughs> is immediately like, what, what are you doing? This is unacceptable. And it's like, well, the kid's being unacceptable, so <laughs> yeah. fuck you. And his perspective, it sucks because, like, the reason I felt bad for him is he's kind of drunk. Well, to certain levels, yeah. he's had certain amounts of alcohol. So it's like, oh, he's been drinking. It's like, well, okay, yeah. but he's still right. <laughs> yeah. You know? yeah. Hey, uh, uh, drunk man's uh, words are sober man's thoughts. Um, <laughs> and uh, and yeah, I I have to admit, in those scenes, like I lived a little vicariously through him um, yeah. because it it was just satisfying to see uh, to see you know that interaction uh yeah. play out yeah yeah um anything else on cha-cha real smooth um let me uh let me check my letterbox blurb for mm-hmm. any further notes nice um, do you guys think <laughs> that this will be in any top 10 list that you may make at the end of the year or um, uh, do you think it'll it'll I, stay with you through the rest of the year I think it will for me. I, I really, really liked this movie a lot. Mm-hmm. Um, nice. You know, I, I could see it going either way for me over time, you know, me le- like, you know, softening on it or, you know, loving it more. I don't know. But um, I'm really enjoying it right now. Thinking back on it, I think it's like I kind of do a progressive list as I'm going throughout the year and change it up as I go. But mm-hmm. right now, I've, I think I've got it at like my number four for the year. Um, so if it's still in the top 10, that might be a little bit surprising by the end of the year, but I expect Mm -hmm. it to be up there for me towards. Nice. Brent, how about you? Yeah, this to me, it's kind of, it, it, I doubt it'll be in my 20 or 30, but I, Mm -hmm. I liked it quite a bit. Um, this to me almost kind of follows slightly the path that Coda did last year. Not oh, that I think yeah. Joseph Earl Smith is going to win Best Picture uh, for, <laughs> Mirrored, for Mirrored at Sundance. Huge uh, Apple TV acquisition, $25 million for Coda, about 15 for mm-hmm. uh, Cha-Cha Real Smooth premieres later uh, that summer. Um, I don't think the Cha-Cha Real Smooth is like a path to Best Picture. Right. But I think in both <laughs> of these, you see like these sort of like feel good stories done right. I think Coda yeah. is a better movie than, than mm-hmm. Cha Cha Real Smooth, but I oh, think yeah. there's a certain, I've, I've kind of had this been a through line in reviews I've written about Apple TV movies. Um, I've seen ones that are worse than this. Uh, Palmer is a great example. Mm-hmm. Uh, Justin Timberlake was in that I mm-hmm. don't think anyone has seen, um, but <laughs> they're all, all three of these movies, although that's just uh, really saccharine in a way that's not good. Um, but these are, there's like a certain wholesome mountain that Apple TV is trying to build on. Uh, Ted, um, Ted Lasso is a show that I've heard, of course, nothing but good things about. That's a really good example of uh, another one that it's like, yeah, it's like comfort food, but it's mm-hmm. they, we stuck broccoli and all the, uh, you know, Omega fats and all that. It, it's like good comfort food done really well. Mm-hmm. And I think they're actually starting to build that brand. Like if you actually look, they have like that Jack McBrayer series. They have like Fraggle Rock. If you oh, actually yeah. look at their content, they're, they're in terms of streamers, I discovered between streamers. They're, and look, they have, you know, Severance, which is much darker. Mm-hmm. Sure. They have uh, Servant, they have Cherry, which is not a good movie, but much darker. <laughs> not all of their stuff is Sunshine and Rainbows, but right. if you look at a lot of their content, they're kind of trying to corner that kind of wholesome market, and it's going to be really interesting yeah. to see. They are putting big money behind this, $25 million, $15 million for these two movies yeah. alone, um, to try to not just build content and, you know, just whatever stuff that people talk about, but really with a focus um, to say like, no, we kind of want it to be stuff that, I don't know, makes people feel good, but hopefully is done artfully and done well. Uh, so I, watching them do that will be, I think a really interesting thing to see in the future. So it doesn't really have to necessarily do with Josh are real smooth, but it's part of it. It's, it's, you can go back to this podcast and say, Oh, here's it started. That's nice. kind of a really cool observation though, Brent. I hadn't really picked up on that from Apple, but I think, I think that's really cool. Yeah, same that, here. That you picked up on it, and also just that they're doing it—that that's a, mm-hmm. a trend that they're kind of pursuing. Yeah, 
there, I there's just this, I was scrolling enough through Apple TV Plus that I was able to see stuff uh, like Little Voice. The or it's not I don't think it's called that, but it's based on Sarah Brelli's music and all that, mm. that stuff. And like yeah. just all this stuff that I was just like uh, I just kind of noticed it scrolling through. So it's also yeah. just interesting in comparison to like you know the I mean the. Netflix brand, right? Yeah, Netflix, yeah. which is just everything. Anything yeah. they can think of gets a series that gets greenlit, regardless of yeah. quality, regardless of... 200 quality. million to this movie and 500,000 <laughs> to this movie. Right. Yeah. Yeah. All right, well, I think that will just about do it for our thoughts on Cha-Cha Real Smooth. Um, what did you guys rate it on Letterboxd also? Um, uh, four out of five for me. Four out of five? Nice. I'm the three and a half out of five man. Nice. <laughs> uh, I also rated it four stars, and uh, I'm actually gonna stick by this one. Uh, so yeah, four stars out of five. Yeah. <laughs> um. <laughs> all right. Well, uh, that should just about do it for this episode, guys. Thank you so much for your time and everything. Um. Why is this your longest episode ever? <laughs> <laughs> oh. Oh, Brent, you uh, no, sweet you summer sweet, child. Sweet summer child. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> uh, no, 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 no. Okay. Um, what are we? Yeah. I don't even know how long it's been. We oh. are at about two hours Over in two the recording. Hours. Yeah, we. Okay. Uh, so at the at the beginning of each year, me, uh, myself, Tiny, and our co-host on sabbatical. He's a recurring co-host now. Uh, Mike, we get together. We're like the three OG hosts of of Obsessive mm-hmm. Viewer. Uh, the beginning of each year, we do a uh, year in review episode where we go through our top tens, honorable mentions, talk about the year. Um, every time it is like it is ne- it's like three and a half hours is probably. Yeah, I could see that with yeah. three people doing top tens plus honorable mentions. plus yep. Talking about the year. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I guys could see that. It's it's awesome i love it so much um, <laughs> uh but yeah so what uh tell tell the listeners where we can find you guys online and uh any stuff you have coming up and uh yeah and all of that good stuff um you can find me andy um on let's see uh twitter at not so handy andy uh on letterboxd at dandable again that's mandible but with a d instead of an m um you can find me on filmyap.substack.com and uh of course my podcast odd trilogies which is on spotify and apple podcasts all the major platforms nice in the kind of central theme of odd trilogies if you want to kind of yeah. yeah Yeah, the the kind of conceit of the series is um, talking about movies in sets of three, hence trilogies, um, that may have kind of an unconventional story beneath the surface. And I don't necessarily mean the actual narrative of the trilogy, but, you know, three films that are connected by, you know, story, director, actor, or, you know, some kind of behind the scenes similarity um, or or thematic content. that we kind of self curate or, you know, they may already be officially announced or officially established trilogies. Um, but we just kind of talk about the, the good and the bad and the weird surrounding them and how they're connected and sort of, uh, you know, celebrate the, the strange ways in which, uh, films build on one another and continue off one another. Sweet. And when are, when is your Jurassic world trilogy episode dropping? That drops, I don't know when this airs, but it drops mm-hmm. uh, June 25th. Saturday. Okay, nice. It will be when, uh, yeah, uh, if you're listening to this, go check it out. Yeah, nice. I'm looking forward to it. Uh, Brent, where can we find you online? Um, easiest way is uh, my website, awakenthedark.com, like awakeinthedark.com. Um, I scattered, I, I couldn't get the, awake in the dark for all my social handles so <laughs> i'm awake in the dark reviews on uh facebook uh ai tv reviews on twitter and then awake in the dark on uh on letterbox and uh yeah awake in the dark the podcast is just me talking with friends and family about new release it's usually about an hour hour and a half and we talk about new streaming releases that we've been doing it's it's uh just sort of a yeah like just 
in that uh, that's sort of like yeah in depth discussion and you know kind of casual conversation with people who aren't necessarily well may, usually people that aren't uh, necessarily like professional critics so it's kind of uh, the kind of it's the layman's podcast you know <laughs> nice real and casual and stuff yeah, yeah. podcast for the people your ivory tower like <laughs> that's <rotten>. right <laughs> Yeah, I'm working on I'm, I'm working on theme music for my podcast this yes. uh, this weekend, and I was going to make it something jazzy and cool, but now I'm just going to make it something like uh, bluegrass oops, or folk. Oops, oops, I'll see there. No, it's going to be like new metal. <laughs> <laughs> oops, I'll see there. That's a new genre. Nice. But uh, I love yeah, it. I think next podcast I'll do is probably Thor. Mm-hmm. You know, next month, and they, you know, hopefully, nope, and yeah. other written reviews. So nice. Yep. Sweet. All right. Well, thank you guys so much for joining me and for taking the time to uh, to make me look good on the podcast. I appreciate it. <laughs> um, uh, for yeah. Us. Yeah, thanks for having us. Uh, of course, yeah. So uh, once again, find me online, everywhere, obsessive viewer, all that stuff. I'm gonna start playing us out, and uh, yeah. Uh, once again, check out Patreon, Patreon.com/slash obsessive viewer for a ton of extra content. Also, check out my other podcast, Tower Junkies, and Anthology. Uh, once again, thank you to uh, Andy and Brent for joining me, and uh, yeah, thank you guys for so much for listening, and uh, I'll see you in the next episode. And now, here's a short clip from our Patreon-exclusive RSS feed. To hear the full clip and more exclusive Patreon content, go to patreon.com slash obsessiveviewer and become a patron at the minimum rate of $1 per month. Thank you and enjoy. And so here we have, like, these fragments. And there's a little bit... I don't know. I I I I do like it. I like this story quite a bit. It's one of my favorites of the of the collection, uh, at least before this read through of it. So we'll see where it uh, stands. But um, I do like the story. But it's just a little bit. Um, it it does work a little bit hard to bring us to the point, and it kind of has this. Um, I don't know how much I want to give away, but it does have this level of, okay, yeah, okay, we're talking about the bees and, and the wasps, like, okay, just get to the point, like, get, like, let's get to getting to where you end civilization, like, what is the deal here? This podcast was edited and produced by Matt Hurt and presented by ObsessiveViewer.com. You can find links to all of our shows at ObsessiveViewer.com slash podcasts. For exclusive bonus content, including reviews, commentaries, and B-roll episodes, you can subscribe to our Patreon at patreon.com slash obsessiveviewer. Thank you so much for listening, and we'll see you in the next episode.